For our next guest, happiness is serious business, and she spent the last 25 years studying this very topic. Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky is professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside. Her work is recognized worldwide. She even landed a million dollar research grant from the National Institute of Mental Health here in the United States. Her latest book is The Myths of Happiness, and I want to welcome to Full Frame. You know what would make me happy is if your last name was Smith. I, I imagine people have gotten it wrong quite a bit, but I did okay, right? They have, but my name means love and peace, so uh, I think so that's nice. If you could squeeze yeah. happiness in there, you'd be perfect. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've had this question a million times, mm -hmm. but I'll ask it anyway. What is happiness? Okay, well, people define happiness differently, um, but researchers define happiness as having two components. The first component is the experience of positive emotions serenity, joy, pride, curiosity, affection. Um, but that's not enough. There's another component, and that is basically the sense that your life is good, feeling like you're progressing towards your life's goals. So you really need both the, the positive emotions and the sense that your life is good to be truly happy. Why is it so elusive? Because you hear people who are just like, God, if I got this, I'd be happy. If I lost 10 pounds, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. And yet if they lost 10 pounds, they wouldn't be happy, right? Because there'd be something else down exactly. the road. Exactly, and that's actually what my book, The Myths of Happiness, is about. Because one of the myths is that you think that, well, I'm not happy now, but I'll be happy when I get married, I lose weight, I make more money. And it turns out that those things do make you happy, but they don't make you as happy for as long as you think they will because you get used to it. People adapt to almost everything. You've done a lot of research on this and I've heard you speak mm -hmm. about this and I thought this was fascinating mm -hmm. to me is the DNA component of it. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at twins, talk a little bit about that. Sure, there's a whole field of research called behavior genetics and scientists look at, they compare identical twins and fraternal twins and they find that identical twins who share 100 percent of their DNA are much more similar in their happiness levels than our fraternal twins. And that suggests that there's a large genetic component to happiness. So, you know, you look around you, some people are just naturally happier than others. So there is a genetic influence to happiness. And framing mm -hmm. the world we live in, I have a friend of mine who says, uh, all bad things are good things in disguise. I mean, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. rather kind of a, a, a utopian way of looking yeah. at things. But then you can have other people who are just miserable. Um, can you change that dynamic? Can you take somebody who's mm -hmm. who's around you and mm -hmm. change them to become a happier person? Right. Well, that's actually kind of what, what we do research on. So I was saying that a large component of happiness is genetic. But also part of happiness is under your control. You know, you can actually change your happiness by changing the ways that you think and the ways that you behave. So, for example, we do studies where we ask people, try to appreciate more what you have. Try to be grateful for the people in your lives. And just changing your perspective uh, makes people happier. One of the other things I think you've talked about is, uh, you know, people giving money. You know, mm -hmm. you've got ten dollars, you can go out and spend it on yourself. You've got ten dollars, mm -hmm. you can go spend it on somebody else. And the people who spend on somebody else tend to feel better, don't they? I mean, aren't That's they right. happier? That's right. That's actually a really cool study, right? So if you spend the same amount of money on someone else, it makes you happier. It's very counterintuitive than spending on yourself. We also do studies where we ask people, go and do acts of kindness. Like tomorrow, do three acts of kindness that you don't normally do. And that is a very powerful way to be to become happier. So the fringe benefit, not only are you helping others, but you're helping yourself by influencing your own well-being. And this kind of gets back to one of the points you were making earlier. I think this is, you know, God, I'm really feeling down. I'm going to go shopping. I'll feel so much happier if I go and buy mm -hmm. stuff for myself. But it's it's not the case in many. Not ways. the case. I mean, of course, it depends what you spend. Spending money can make you happier. <laughs> so I'm not saying that that is not, you should never do that. But it matters what you spend your money on. So spending money on other people works. Spending money on things that can help you grow. So for example, take a cooking class, take learn a new language. Spending money on things that help you connect with others. So if you go out to dinner with family or friends, that can make you happier. You got into this field when it really wasn't even a field. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you almost have to kind of start from scratch, don't you? So how did you figure out, okay, this is how we're going to measure happiness. This is how we're going to go about this. I mean, it, you kind of had to, did you learn by design or how did it right, go? Right, right, right. So my very first day in graduate school, this was 1989, so this was 25 years ago, 
my advisor and I start talking about well, what is happiness and what is the secret to happiness? Why are some people happier than others? And back then only one person, Ed Diener, who's at Illinois, was studying happiness. He didn't even call it happiness. He called it subjective well-being because the word happiness had this sort of fuzzy connotation. And so, you know, us and other researchers started to develop really good measures of happiness. Now, you know, economists are studying it, neuroscientists are studying it, it's become this sort of huge field. But yes, it's been kind of a long process in the making. You know, what's interesting is uh, Google has people on staff now to try and make sure that the employees are happy. Mm -hmm. And yet, I've worked at places where people were just miserable 24-7. Do you think that that's going to become a trend as we move forward, that more companies are going to think about you know, the happiness of their employees? I think it already is a trend. And I certainly get asked to give talks at companies or consult with companies that are interested in making their employees happier, as well as their cu customers and clients. So I think it's already a trend. And we know that happier people are more productive. We know that happier people are more creative. They make more money. They they are better negotiators, they're better leaders. So I think it's good for companies to make sure their employees are happier, not just because it's good for the employees, but it's good for their bottom line as well. So talk about the different countries. What have we found in terms of where are people happy? Sure, sure. Well, there's different surveys and they find different things and it depends how you measure happiness. So if you measure happiness by asking people how satisfied are you with your life in general, then usually the Scandinavian countries, you know, Netherlands and, well, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and then Switzerland, Netherlands, they usually come up on top. Um, when you ask people uh, how happy were you yesterday, sort of measuring positive emotions, then it's the Latin American, South American countries, Panama, Nicaragua, Paraguay, that come out on top. That's interesting. Now, the bottom is almost always the same. These are the sub-Saharan countries, Sierra Leone, Togo. These are the really poor African countries. Um, countries that are at war, that have instability, corruption. So we're talking about Sudan, uh, Chad, former Soviet republics, Belarus, uh, Tajikistan. So um, it's pretty clear sort of what, what factors I think are associated wow. with happiness when it comes to the country level. What do you think is the thread when you talk about mm -hmm. the Scandinavian countries? Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the things that you see there that perhaps leads to the people being happy? Sure, sure. Well. Um, you know, this, uh, a good social safety net, um, social capital. So countries where people say that I have someone that I can count on um, are ones that, that have, that are happier. In, in, uh, I'm sorry, that are ones that are happier. Um, higher GDP, so wealthier countries are happier. Countries that are, are democratic, that have people feel a sense of freedom and liberty, uh, equal rights are, are happier as well. Let's talk about the United States and China. Where do they land in the spectrum? Sure, sure. Well, again, depends how you measure it. If you measure happiness in terms of positive emotion, both the U.S. and China are, I would say, in the top third of countries, maybe top 25 percent. If you ask how satisfied are you with your life, the U.S. tends to be very high, maybe top 10 percent, sometimes even top 5 percent. China, about half, maybe even the bottom third. Mm. But has it improved since we've seen such an explosion in economic growth? Uh... Well, counterintuitively, economic growth does not always, is not always sort of go along with increases in well-being. And so I th I'm pretty sure that in the U.S. and China, um, changes, in and, uh, changes in economic growth have not sort of uh, Fueled the change yeah. with, with changes in well-being. You know, and that kind of gets yeah. back to some of the earlier points mm -hmm. you were making. You know, I, I hear these stories all the time. Mm -hmm. Christmas rolls around, the kids get like 40 million mm -hmm. gifts, and then they're playing with the ball of plastic afterwards. That's what, you know, thrills them. Right. And so getting tons and tons of stuff doesn't necessarily that's translate right. into that, that's happiness. That's right. It does not. The material things tend not to be associated with happiness unless they sort of get you out of poverty. Okay, so if you're poor or if you don't have sort of basic safety and your basic needs met, um, then you're not going to be happy. So when you, th when you think about China, for example, if there are more people in China who have their basic needs met today than, than they did, say, 25 years ago, that's going to translate into more happiness. In the U.S., there haven't been that many changes with sort of the percent of people whose basic needs are met across time. Marriage, right. children, are there certain things that you check them off the list that, I mean, I know you've got four kids. I know that kids <laughs> can bring you a lot of joy. They can also be maddening at times, I know. right? Kids make me happy. So um, that is actually a very complicated question. We have a, my student, Katie Nelson, and I have a whole line of research on happiness and parenting. It turns out that parents are happier than people who don't have kids, but it depends what kind of parent you are. It depends what kind of kid you have. So if you're married, if you're relatively older, right, so young parents who don't have jobs and aren't married are not very happy. 
Uh, if you have kids who are very young, you tend or teenagers, you tend not to be that happy, <laughs> no, right? Definitely. So it's middle ages, elementary school years, or empty nest. Um, and obviously, if you have problematic kids, if your kids are a huge challenge, you're not going to be happier than people without kids. External forces. How much of happiness can we really control? You know, one analysis shows that about 10% of happiness is due to sort of life circumstances. And people are shocked to hear that, right? They think, well, if I had more money, if I were more beautiful, if I were married, I'd be happier. But again, as I was saying before, th those things do make people happy, but we get used to them. So if you're, if you're beautiful, you probably are used to that. And then you want something else to make you happy. If you have money, you know, you get a raise, then you start spending it, and then suddenly you feel like it's not enough and you want even more. And so that's why we really want to focus on kind of those internal things. How appreciative are you of what you have? How positive are you about the future? What your relationship, what your relationships are like? Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming on Full Frame. It's been a delight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Technology is now very much a part of the human experience, but can it accurately measure and analyze something as uniquely human as empathy? We'll find out next.